I'm Maria Shemkelian and I'm beyond excited today because we have Willie Garson and who is not a fan of Willie Garson? So of course we know Willie from Sex and the City, from White Collar and many other amazing films and TV shows. And if I say the number of how many, it's just unbelievable. So Willie, we're going to start with a set. It just points out to how old I am. Oh, no, 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 no. It just points out at how busy you are. So we're yeah. beyond grateful that you actually found time for us. So the first question is always, how did you get started? Um, I, well, I got started acting in school, like many people, mm -hmm. um, but very young. In elementary school, I was like seven or eight. And we did plays at our school, so I did those. And then professionally, I was 13 and someone in our town, I grew up about 30 miles outside of New York and someone in our town worked at a theater in New York and they were looking for a 13 year old boy. And uh, I went into New York and I read for it um, and I got it. Uh, three of us were hired because it didn't really matter. The kid was asleep on the couch for most of the play. Um, but so they rotated us who did it. Uh, so not one kid was carrying all of it. And that was when I got my first professional start and got in the union and all of that and got an agent and all of that nonsense. So it was exactly the worst way it was supposed to happen. A family friend brought me to an audition. That's how it started. <laughs> People say they want to be an actor. And I teach in my acting class, I teach, why do you want to be an actor? Mm -hmm. And you have to be honest. And people are not honest. Because for most people, it's a hobby. Mm -hmm. They did all the plays at school. They did all the plays in their church group. They were always the best one. And they liked getting girls. And they liked, you know, people paying attention to them. And whatever. But that's not a reason to become an actor. Yeah. Um, so I, I always ask them why. What, what is your purpose? To tell stories, to, to, to help humanity, to give people a fuller life, uh, to show your empathy for society, uh, to make people laugh, uh, to make people feel things. <clears throat> They're all valid reasons, but you have to know your reasons. And it can't be, it can't be to make a lot of money. Yeah. That can't be, that's not a reason to do anything. 100%. Do you think that you are at an advantage over other actors who just had maybe acting training, one-on-one -on -one classes, uh, workshops, but not formal acting school background? And also something about your acting schools, which classes affected you the most? What do you remember the most from there? How it benefited you? Um, you know, any, any kind of training is good training. Mm -hmm. Even if it's bad training, it's good training. Because it can teach you, oh, I, I know not to do that. Um, the, uh, the important thing is to always be acting. If you want to act, you got to act. So you have to act every day, whether that's in school or joining a theater company or doing scenes with your friends or whatever. If you want to act, you got to act. That's the, that's the training. Mm -hmm. As far as formal school, I never think of like it's one thing. It's more of a whole lifestyle. Um, I'm certainly not an elegant ballet dancer, but my movement class was very important. Um, I, at college, I majored in theater and psychology. So I was more cerebral. I wanted to learn about the kind of people that I'm going to play. What, what is really going on in people's minds? So when I attack a script, uh, I now have a deeper understanding of the people, hopefully because of my psychology degree. Um, in terms of theater, you know, the best training is doing it. Yeah. And not doing it in a way uh, that, you know, I love that people do, I, listen, I had a teacher once. I went to Yale for a summer and we had the graduate school faculty and the guy wrote my, my review at the end of the summer. 
And he wrote that I would have a much happier life uh, in community theater and that I shouldn't pursue theater as a profession. So that was his take on it. And uh, it probably wasn't wrong at the time, um, but I, I respect everyone who wants to go do theater and plays and make little movies at home. That means that you're passionate about it and that you're thrilled doing it. So in terms of that, those people don't need to train so much. All they want to do is do it, go do it. But if you want to be a professional actor, you have to have an entire bag of tricks in your pocket that you can only get through repeated training, just like anything else, just like learning how to play baseball or anything else. I know how to walk. I know how to read a script. Mm -hmm. I know how to listen to the other characters. I know how to write down the background of my character. I know how to do all that because I was trained for years and years how to do it. So now it's just second nature. Yeah. Um, and when I don't get to act for a while, I have to go back. I have to go sit and, with my acting teacher since I was 13 years old, the same guy. Uh, He's now 300 years old, basically. <laughs> and I have to sit with him and go over like, oh, I forgot about, I haven't, I haven't done anything for three months. I have no idea. But that's why I try and act every day. That's why I got, honestly, I never get these jobs. But it's why I got a voiceover agency, because there's a lot of more auditions. So my chance of acting every day is much higher. I'll at least have some crappy voiceover audition. So I can pretend like I'm acting that day. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's important to always be acting. Mm -hmm. What about the acting techniques that you mostly relate to? And who are some of your mentors or maybe books that you can suggest that helped you a lot? Yeah, I, I mean, God, there's so many. <laughs> I, I, I'm more, I guess, uh, a modified uh, method actor. Mm -hmm. So modified Stanislavski. Mm -hmm. um, I do, obviously I work mostly in TV and film. So I do have the mindset that it's a two way street. It's me and the audience. We're in it together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes pure Stanislavski gets a little tricky uh, because the actor is having this amazing emotional experience and they're not sharing it with the audience. Mm -hmm. So I do believe in the shared experience. I, if I'm doing a scene and you're watching it, I'm aware that you're watching it. Mm -hmm. So the points that I want to make emotionally <clears throat> or just facts in the scene, I have to make sure that you're getting them. You, the audience member. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, books, there's, uh, books are hard. I mean, I, I don't, when I'm preparing a script, I don't, I'm not running to a book to read a chapter about yeah. how to act. <laughs> um, so, but I would say method, Stanislavski, what is basically what they were saying, and it's the greatest point ever, is who are you? Who am I? What is this chair? It's the same thing. What is this person? What is this vessel? What are my life experiences? You know, you see junkie actors who are like, they go, oh, I'm great. I can, I can cry at anything. I can cry uh, at any, any scene, I can cry. It's like, really? Well, now you're telling me a trick, but what are you thinking about to make you cry? because there has to be some depth behind it. I can see when you're phony. I don't want to see a phony performance. I want to see a real performance. Yeah. So this guy just lost his girlfriend. He's very upset. He thought they were going to get married and whatever. We have that experience inside of us. All of us have that experience. So you have that to remember how you felt that day mm -hmm. when the actual one broke up. Now it's this guy, it's the same thing. It's just you as this guy in the scene, but it's really you, it's your body. 
and your thoughts and your emotions yeah. um, coming through the, the lines of the dialogue. Yeah. But you can, you can take any script. Let's say you have a paragraph, it's two sentences long. You should be able to write a page and a half about those two sentences to get you to the truth of those two sentences in your life. What is my truth to say those two sentences? Mm -hmm. Well, that reminds me of when, you know, my father beat me and hit me in the basement. You know, <laughs> it could, it could remind you of that. Sure. Now let me see that when you say those lines. Let me see what's going on. Yeah. And with auditions, uh, what are some of your effective techniques or maybe some secrets <laughs> to being remembered in the audition room? Because there are a lot of great talent. Yeah, coming nothing, nothing is remembered more than uh, preparedness mm -hmm. and confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, confidence doesn't mean uh, you know, I'm a big actor, I'm cocky. Confidence over the script and the character. I want to, you're coming in to audition for me. So you have to put, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Would, would, what I always ask my students, would you hire you mm -hmm. after that audition? So you have to be self-aware enough to know what you look like when you come in the room. Yeah. Are you stuttering? Are you uncomfortable? Are you afraid? Are you lying? Are you lying about, how are you today? I'm great. Really? You look like you're about to have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. So say it. Say I'm a little nervous because I don't understand this one section of the scene. People bring in all this baggage and all this insecurity and fear into the audition room. I don't want to hire that. I don't want to be around that. Yeah. I want to be with someone who has read the script, mm -hmm. enjoys the script, knows the character, knows the situation, and brings themselves into that character. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hire someone who's second guessing what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I saw a guy in the waiting room. I'm going to do it like him. I don't want you to do it like him. I want you to do it like you. And that's where acting training comes, comes along. The, the, way, the way we start everything is uh, um, a thing is what it is. So this is a chair. I'm sitting in a chair. Once I know the properties of this chair... I can turn it into a throne. I can turn it into a bus driver's seat. I can turn it into whatever. That's how we have to be with ourselves when we go into an audition. I, I can't play a guy who has long, beautiful hair. I can play a guy who thinks he has long, beautiful hair. That, that could be funny. <laughs> but I can also be a guy who does this because that's the reality. That's who I am. I have no hair up here. So once I know that, I can create with it. And people have to know who they are when they walk into an audition. Be confident that you've done everything you can to know about this script and this character. That's what you're there for. You're not there to make a best friend. You're not there for people to like you. Mm -hmm. You're there for people to want to work with you because wow, she really knows that script. She knows that character. She did things that I didn't even see. And I've been working on this script for two years. I didn't even know that about the character, but she knows it. And she brought it into the room. Now I want her on my set. Wow. Thank you. That, sure. Uh, yeah, that's a good breakdown on how to dissect the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the sides. That's perfect. And how do you, when, when you're already on set, and uh, one thing is theater, and you've done a lot of theater too. When you are in character, go through the whole performance, don't get out of character. And on set, it's, you know, cut, reset, cut, reset, many, many, many times. How do you, do you get in and out of character? Do you stay in character and don't let anybody bother you while they're resetting the scene? How do you keep it authentic? It depends on the scene. Okay. 
obviously. Sure. If the scene is, uh, let's go get a cup of coffee, uh, and that's the end of the scene, uh, you know, we don't have to be that, yeah. there's no depth really, except you are playing that character from the moment you get there to the moment you leave. Mm -hmm. So you're in it, uh, but you can drop out depending on the situation. If there's a difficult scene, highly emotional, highly charged, a lot of dialogue, a lot of information, a lot of information about the person, that's a, that's a very different day at work yeah. because you're that guy all day. Mm -hmm. You're in it all day. Uh, anything out of that is not helping put the best possible performance forward. Mm -hmm. So you want to get the best possible performance, especially on TV and film. You only have one shot at it. When we're done shooting this scene, we're done with this scene forever. So you have one shot. You don't get to come back tomorrow with a new audience. So uh, you, if, if, it's a, if it's a charged item, funny or sad, it doesn't matter. You're in it all day. Mm -hmm. If you have an impediment of uh, an accent or something, then you're in that accent all day because you can't, you can't cheat the audience. You're not cheat, you're not allowed. And the camera, the camera, it's impossible to cheat. Camera picks up everything. So you, you can't, you know, you can see the difference. We watch, we all watch certainly during pandemic, we all watch TV, you know, 52 hours a day. And you can see a great performance right next to a terrible performance. And it's because one is being honest and is in it and one is not, one is just phoning it in. Just like show, oh, I showed up, I earned my money. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, you, you know, but the, the, the problem with people working for a long time often is they feel, oh, I've been doing this forever. I know what I'm doing, but every day is different. It's a different script. Yeah. It's a different scene. Um, that's why you see some of these shows, these long running hour long shows on like CBS is the, is the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, criminal of it. These the shows that have been on forever. It's like this week is the case, the case of the missing, uh, the missing artifact. And like, oh, we've done the, we've done 20 episodes just like this. And then we find it. And then, uh, and then he says that and it's like, you can see it in their eyes. Their eyes are dead. They're dead. Yeah. It's not a new scene. They're not treating it like a new scene. What can I bring to the scene that's different, even though it's the same kind of scene? What can I do to make it different today? To make it better? Not even better, just different. So that it's more interesting to watch. It has some more truth to it. Yeah. Or the last time we caught the criminal, I didn't do it right because I didn't, I didn't remember that he was married and he had a baby. So the next time that we do a scene where we're taking down the criminal, I'm going to play that I'm very aware that he's married and has a baby. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see how that makes a scene different. Wow. And what happens if you're working in a show for a while and then you see the new scene, new script, new, you know, new episode, and you just really don't like it. And I'm sure that happens. And all the time. Yeah. All the time. How do you deal with it? <laughs> in it depends. It depends. In my case, because I'm a loudmouth, but I'm also a, a partner. I treat it as a partner. Yeah. Is there anything I can do mm -hmm. to help you make this better? Mm -hmm. And that, in my case, because I also write, so in my case, that ends up with, what if instead of saying, uh, hey, you, come here, what if I said, excuse me, mm -hmm. now it doesn't sound so cheesy, and it sounds like something that someone would say. Mm -hmm. Now, does that help make it one billionth better? Great. Let's do that. And they add up. 
listen, there have been times, there was a show I had. Uh, I mean, can I say it? Yeah, I mean, so like oftentimes on Hawaii Five-0, uh, there, there were issues where, wh why am I saying this? It's not helpful to the scene and it doesn't seem to matter in the story. It doesn't tell the story. And I had been told, well, you know, we're gonna cut from this scene to a shot of an ass on, in a bikini running down the beach. So it really doesn't matter. And I'm like, well, if it doesn't matter, then why are we saying it? Let's say something that matters. Yeah. As long as we're all here, we're all, we all showed up, the cameras are here, we're all wearing costumes, they put makeup on us, we might as well say something that matters. <laughs> so that, that would happen quite often. Yeah, yeah, it must, it must, must be challenging when it's like you're kind but, of dissonance with it, itself. It, it has to have a reason. Actors, certainly egotistical actors, have a reputation for like, well, I mean, shouldn't I say blah, 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 blah? And it has to have a reason. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, when I'm discussing, I'm being kind by saying discussing, when I'm yelling at a producer or a director as to why this isn't working, nine times out of 10, my, my suggestion is my character doesn't need to say that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let's not have a line for me right there. Yeah. Let's cut the line. Wow. And that is something that people are not uh, expecting. They think <laughs> that you're going to say, well, I should really have a three page monologue <laughs> with the camera on me and no other people in the scene. That's, that's really what they're expecting. But for some of us, that's not the case. Telling the story is more important than I don't need more footage of me. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that it's, you know, it's a team effort and it's all for the good of the, com of the product that everybody's working together. It should be, yeah. yeah. Union is a big question for many actors because while, of course, union protects you on so many levels and I'm a proud union member, but when you're just starting out, it's so hard to get union jobs. So when do you think actors are ready to finally make that transition? Because there are ways to make a living by non-union commercials and other ways, but getting into the big films is, of course, the dream. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a hard situation because mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, most jobs won't see you if you're not in the union um, and you can't get the job unless you're in the union. So it's a hard thing. Um, it's a decision to make uh, that this is really what I'm going to do for a living, not as a um, beloved hobby, which is fine. I mean, people have to really make that decision. There certainly have been jobs uh, over the years that have come to me and uh, that would have been really great and fun to do, but they're non-union. And I am by law, as a member of a union, I have to follow my union. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a tough thing. When I was a kid, which is many years ago in New York, that was the holy grail was to get the union card. Um, there was also a lot more opportunities um, to get in the union back then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, extras, extras on TV commercials, that was a Screen Actors Guild job. So a lot of people could sneak in that way um, and get in the union. Uh, I, I got a job. Mm -hmm. So I got in the union. I mean, that, yeah. uh, that's, it happened very simply. Uh, when, when I got the job, I got the union. Mm -hmm. I, it cost more to join the union than I made on that job. Um, and then <laughs> at least now, when people do get to join the union, at least it's one union. It's Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and Federation. It used to be then when I got to California, I got another job and it wasn't Screen Actors Guild. Mm -hmm. It was AFTRA. 
And I had to join that union and that cost more money than I was being paid on the job. So now at least it's one union, you only have to join once. Um, and then you're open to audition for commercials and movies and TV shows. Um, I think most of your people are in the Pennsylvania area. No, so we're actually all around. Oh, okay, but I mean, Everybody there's a lot. Everybody who's watching is all around. <laughs> I mean, the, the, an interesting thing was when I was a kid also, New York was uh, commercials. Mm -hmm. And now it's commercials and movies and TV, a lot of TV, which was not the case uh, when I was a kid. There were maybe two or three TV shows that shot in New York uh, and a couple of soap operas. Mm -hmm. But now it's full production. I mean, there's 20 something shows, uh, my own included. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been shooting in New York now for 25 years. Um, uh, TV shows that wouldn't have shot in New York before. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, Atlanta has a lot of Screen Actors Guild, uh, SAG after a jobs. Uh, obviously, Vancouver, Canada, Toronto, Canada, uh, very popular. Um, and uh, it's an interesting thing to decide, like, I'm really going to do this and try and only do professional jobs. That's a decision to make. Obviously, it comes with being part of a, a brother and sisterhood of union members mm -hmm. with many protections and... Uh, credits toward pension and credits towards healthcare. I mean, all of it is comes part of being part of a union. So that's a decision you have to make. Yeah. It's been as, as certainly this year, as production has halted, I know a lot of people have been tempted to shoot non-union. This is exactly when you need to shoot union uh, to be protected. Sure. <laughs> this is the exact time when you need a union, not the time to run away and chase after the couple of hundred dollars for some crappy job that's non-union uh, may be great for that week, but in the long run, it's gonna keep you out of the union and it's gonna keep you out of being considered a professional, so. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great way to put it. If you're I'm a, I'm a, union, about, I'm a yeah. union man, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. If you're serious about it and want to open the right doors, I, I'm, I'm glad you, brought that up so uh because it, a lot of people are struggling with that decision but it is I an mean, important it, decision to make in order to like, be considered a professional like for example i did a i did a picture about two years ago mm -hmm. and it was a friend so low low budget uh you know they made a deal with sag after for the actors but the rest of it was non-union including the director who was terrible who was not in the director's guild yeah. And I said to the producer, I said, you know, God, this guy is terrible. And she goes, yeah, I know. Uh, I said, I should have been directing this. She goes, yeah, but we're not, we're not Directors Guild. We couldn't afford it. Because then when you hire Directors Guild director, you have to have assistant director, second assistant director, all has to be union. Um, and when I joined the Directors Guild, and I could have directed a bunch of crappy movies that are not Directors Guild. And when I joined the Directors Guild, it was, I was doing an episode of my show of uh, White Collar. And um, I think because it was cable, I think it was $26,000 was the fee to direct minus commission, taxes, whatever. To join the Directors Guild was $18,000. So it cost me money because uh, by the time I paid taxes and commissions, I was much less than eighteen thousand yeah. dollars, and uh, it cost me money to do that first job. <laughs> wow! But to do that first job, so in order to join the directors guild, yeah. do you have to do a union job to join, like in the screen actors guild, or can you just uh, pay, well, join, and do it? <laughs> How does well, it work? One, one of the benefits of having your own show is that if I negotiate that they have to let me direct. They have to let me direct. So the production company or whoever you're working for has to sponsor you for membership. Uh -huh. So that's how that works. Yeah. Uh, it's a difficult union to get into. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you can continue to work, it's an amazing union. The mm -hmm. best benefits, the best health plan, the best everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's harder to get jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so. Sure. 
with directing, uh, how did you, because your background is in acting, your school, you went to acting school that we will get into. Uh, did you learn directing on set as you were observing directors working? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I've always been, uh, not every actor is like this, but I've always been very collaborative, mm -hmm. like a team player with my director, my producer, camera, props, wardrobe, all of it. I've always been a partner rather than just tell me where to stand. I'm in my dressing room. I'm waiting. Just tell me where to go. I'm not that person. I'm always on set. I'm always talking to the director. I'm always looking where they're setting camera. I'm always looking how they're lighting it. Um, I'm always looking how to block the scene, the movement in the scene. I, I've been studying that since I'm a kid. Mm -hmm. So you know, after 40 years of standing on a set, I was like, I, I want to do this. And it wasn't when I started on, on white collar, it wasn't that this is to launch my brilliant directing career. It was, I'm going to make a better episode. I know this show inside and out. I know these characters inside and out, and we're going to tell this story that's important. This one episode that I'm going to make a better episode than some other jerk that you're going to bring in who's just hired for the week, who, who's just is a guest. There are, you know, our, our directors on directors on TV shows are generally, they're like having a guest star. It's a guest mm -hmm. unless they've been on the show for a long time and done a bunch of episodes, but they're not one of us. They're, they're someone visiting. So let I, I, that's how I pitched it to NBC Universal and to Fox. I said, let me make a better episode because I've been, I'm standing here every day. I know what this show looks like, smells like, feels like, breathes like. Um, so let me do it. And of course I made a great episode. And then, and then I got to do another show that uh, was not my show, but I had spent a lot of time with. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, it did feel like family again. And I went and did that show and it was great. It was great. Of course, I made a greater episode. I've been there for years mm -hmm. uh, with these people. Um, that was a kid's show. I mean, I grew up with these kids. So uh, for years and years and years. So I knew all of them intimately, you know, we're family. Yeah. And uh, so of course I made a better episode. That episode, a show I, that was not my show, but that episode was nominated for an Emmy. You know, and that's how it should be. That's so. amazing. Yeah, that's inspiring. I mean, that's the passion. That's the passion that yeah, we're trying to, to get people to feel in order to go into this field because it's a tough field. So you really have to feel like the way you were just story. describing. It's not like, it's not like, you know, I'm really interested in insurance. <laughs> I'm going to go into insurance. I'm passionate about numbers and insurance and finding people deals on insurance and making people comfortable. That's something I'm passionate about. That's why you should do something, mm -hmm. it, whatever it is. I'm passionate about bagging groceries. I can do it better than anyone else. Yeah. That, that's why you go into something. You don't go into something like, oh, this is a, this is a way to make a quick buck. This is a way to do something. Uh, I, I see people in entertainment uh, making billions of dollars. So that's why I wanna do it. It's not a reason to do something. It's a benefit. If it works out, great. If not, you should want to do it even if you weren't paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You want to just as much if you weren't paid. Yeah, no, 100%. You directed an episode that you also acted in, which is a big challenge. So can you please describe the challenges that you have encountered doing that? And how did you solve those challenges as simultaneously direct and acting? Um, well, let's start by saying I did not solve them. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't think about it enough. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, well, I'll set it up mm -hmm. with my stand in. I'll call action and I'll do it. And then I'll watch it on the monitor and see if it was okay. And I have to say that my performance in, I'm thinking of an episode of White Collar. My performance is not the best mm. in that episode. Um, it's fine. I was playing the character for a long time, so it's fine. But I wished, 
I wish that I was better at it. Mm-hmm. So next time, then the next thing I directed, I was not in, mm-hmm. which was much better. Um, but next time I get the chance to direct myself, I will now know to take a little more time, have my assistant director maybe pick up some of the slack if I'm in the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and that's it. I don't think we had, I don't remember if we had a playback monitor, but that's an expensive thing that you have to really fight for um, if you're acting in it as well. You're gonna need that playback monitor so you can see what happened over there. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. No, no, thank you for being honest about it. Yeah. Uh, because many dream to both direct and be in the film. And it's really hard, especially when you're just starting out. It's very Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and when you're just starting out, you don't have the money for the playback. Mm. Um, so you really have to have an eye that's trusted. I'll tell you what I would do if it was certainly, if it was videotape, if it was tape, uh, so it's not expensive to do another take. Mm-hmm. I would probably do a take with a stand-in mm-hmm. with me watching on the monitor and then doing all the adjustments I need to do. And then those are locked in stone. And then someone is responsible for calling that an assistant director or whatever, mm-hmm. just do it exactly like that as technically. And then you can just concentrate on the acting, but you know, with what has been set before. I, I, I should have done it more with my stand-in doing the scene. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So there's a lot of rejection that happens in this industry. And a lot of it, I mean, I've encountered it myself where you come in, oh, your eyes are too close together. Sorry, next, you know, and it just, you know, it can be looks, it can, it can be anything, you know, and something you'd never even realized about yourself that, you know, casting people see. So how do you fight that, you know, self-doubt or, you know, self-image issues when people say things like that and that's okay? <laughs> Here's the thing. Yeah. The the rejection and not getting a job. So much of it has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. Um, To the, all the way down to uh, you remind them of an ex-girlfriend who they hated. (laughs) There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. What happens when we take it personally and we get upset by it. The reason we're getting upset really is because we didn't control everything that was in our control. Mm. And that's a bad feeling. And it's hard to admit it. I didn't do everything I could do. I didn't study the script enough. I wasn't confident and strong enough as the character. So my rejection, well, this other guy, I mean, he was the guy. Well, you don't know. You don't know what he did to prepare. You didn't know what, you don't, You weren't sitting in the room at his audition and maybe he was amazing. Maybe he worked harder. Yeah. If I don't get a job and I've worked my absolute hardest There's nothing on that for me. I did everything I can do. That's the best I could do. There's certain traps that are caused by the uncomfortableness of the situation. The traps being, uh, do you have any questions? That's a great trap when you go into an audition. So you immediately think, oh shit, should I have a question? Am I supposed to have a question? It's a, it's a, the script is about a talking dog. I mean, do I have any, if I had any questions, you should call a mental hospital. I I mean, but it's trying to make a comfortable situation that actually ends up being uncomfortable. So I, I just like to be prepared. If I'm fully prepared and I'm listening and I'm present, whatever happens in the room, uh, I'm present for, and I did my best, then it's not a rejection because it has nothing to do with you. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. It's a, it's a healthy way to look at it. Um, 
you never know. You never know. You walk into the room and the person coming in after you have worked for them 20 times and they love working with you. Yeah. So they hire that person. There's one guy, one guy came in who I knew uh, for white collar. I knew him. A bigger, a bigger actor than the part, actually, but everyone needs jobs. He needed a job. And he came in and it was like a nerdy guy uh, and the pretty girl pays him attention, which is not something that happens to him often. Well, he read it wrong and he came in as Casanova. Unbuttoned shirt, a necklace with a horn, an Italian horn on it. Like he was a studly guy and he did it and it didn't, it didn't work at all. Easily completely out of his control. Another director could have said, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. And he could have left and they bring in the next guy. Because I'm an actor and I understand what people are going through. I said to him, I said, that's not what I was looking for. Do you have your glasses in your bag? Put on your glasses. Let's button up your shirt. You're a dork and you never get the girl and that she's talking to you is the biggest day of your life. He goes, oh, he mm -hmm. did it. He was freaking brilliant. Wow. And I hired him and he did the show and he was amazing. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, under his control that I gave him an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Another director could have easily said, thanks for coming in, go home. Like, boy, after the second he leaves the room, that guy sucked. I mean, e easily. That easily could have happened. And like it would, yeah. And it's not under his control. Yeah. So you just have to let that go only, but do not let go that I didn't do everything I could to understand the script and this character. Yeah. Now, what about uh, the feeling of self-actualization? when you can't really put uh you can't really put timelines in this job you can't be like you know within a year i plan to have accomplished this this and this you can't it just doesn't work like that in this job so how do you still feel accomplished you feel like you're self-actualizing actualizing as a professional when you can't really follow a certain path that you you know put up for yourself well you know you know that you're you feel better more confident acting mm -hmm because you're practicing every day, even if you have no place to act. Um, you might be getting some uh, positive reinforcement from the outside world. Listen, if I, went, if I went for 10 years when I started and no one gave me a call back and I never got a job, that's the universe is telling me you should do something else. Mm -hmm. The universe is telling you. So I, I truly believe the universe will tell you you're a more engaging person. You're more, even if you never, you, you never are working, but you're working on becoming an actor. You're noticing that people are more interested in you, in your life. People are more engaged with you. You're more present. You're more engaged with other people. You're more interested in other people. All of a sudden, the whole world is opening around you. And then that will translate eventually to getting a part in a play or even, I don't care if you're playing the father in a diaper commercial that, I mean, that's a role you're playing the part. Yeah. So play the part. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to make your, make your role as the father in the diaper commercial. It's not the, the piece is not about the father. The piece is about the diaper. So you want to support whatever the piece is about. But you're going to be able to get, it'll be more comfortable, more confident that you don't have to, there's nothing worse than an actor at a dinner party showing off all the time and telling the most stories and being the loudest and telling the most jokes. It's about being present where you are, reading the room, understanding each other, understanding what this person needs from you. You know, they say like the, the cheesy statement that 90% of acting is reacting. 
It's actually true. It's more interesting for me to listen to you and how you're thinking than what I'm thinking. Then I can react to it because I'm actually present and listening to you. I can feel the background in psychology. Definitely yes, of reflect. course. Yeah, but that, but that, will, that will, as you study acting and work hard mm -hmm. at it, that will show itself throughout your whole life. It's not just, oh, now when I'm doing a scene, it's also when you're talking to your wife or whatever, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're more present. Yeah. Uh, now we're gonna move on to some more global advice for people who are in this field. So what is your guidance for parents in film? And uh, you have an incredible story. And actually, uh, many of the questions submitted were about the adoption process that you went through. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of amazing interviews of you talking about it, which I listened to. Now, how do you combine parenting and the unpredictability of this job in terms of traveling, in terms of hours? Just you never well, know where you're going to end up, you know? It's, it's not just, I mean, it's not just in this business, mm -hmm. uh, the number one priority that the kid has to feel always that they're number one. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. And that can be very hard. It's, it's very hard in this business because actors have been uh, mostly self-centered the whole time. Mm -hmm. It's all about me. Uh, I'm, I am, I'm Willie Garson. I'm an actor. This is Willie Garson Incorporated. Everything about Willie Garson is Willie Garson's doing. So when, if I'm going to get on the treadmill, if I'm going to do whatever, everything is to feed the machine that is Willie Garson. So once another being shows up where the only appropriate focus is on that person all the time, that's the only appropriate response to having a child mm -hmm. is that it's all about them. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult and you just do it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes, you will have to juggle some things. You know, I lit right, right before I got on with you, I literally just got off the phone with Sarah Jessica. Now, Sarah Jessica has three children mm -hmm. and many businesses and a career, mm -hmm. but you do not mess with her when she's dealing with her kids. It's not even an issue. Yeah. Um, for my son, it was a very, it was hard because I had just started white collar mm -hmm. when I got Nathan. And again, no plan as to when I was gonna get Nathan. It happened when it happened. Right. And white collar happened when it happened. Mm -hmm. The problem for us, which is, uh, it's superhuman. Uh, now that I'm older, I would not do it this way, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, white collar shot 3000 miles away from where we live. Mm -hmm. So that first uh, year or two years, um, no, the first year really, uh, I spent on an airplane. That was it. If I had one night off, I would come home. Mm -hmm. I would come home for six hours no. and go back to the airport. Wow. That's commitment. That's amazing. Until my kid said to me, you don't have to do this anymore. No. And I said, of course I have to do it. He goes, no, you don't. Because you proved, because he was new to me. He said, you proved something to me. When you say you're coming home, you come home. And he had never felt that before. Yeah. Now, as a show, because we all had kids and now the show was a hit, mm -hmm. so now we had power, we went in and said, listen, we can't shoot this show during the school year. We can't do it. So we have to shoot May to September mm -hmm. because then our kids can come with us to New York Mm -hmm. Our kids can come to set. Our kids can go to camp in New York. Uh, and, 
and we can live our lives because we have children. We can't do this nonsense. And that's what we did. We, they moved the show. They moved the shooting of the show for us. That's amazing. Now, if I got Nathan now, because I'm older and it's exhausting, um, I would have picked him up and moved to New York for real with him. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to do that to him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't at the time. But you just, you know, you, you prioritize. You know, uh, there's actors, uh, I, can't, I can't do any, I, I can't do that. I, I can't deal with my family, I'm working. I have a good friend who's like that. Wow. And the, when he's working, all of, the, all of the stuff at home falls on his partner's shoulders. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. And uh, I just have never been that way. And maybe, maybe I'm not a good enough actor for that. Or maybe, um, you know, I'm not committed enough. But I'm sorry, my family comes first. It's easier now for me because my kid's in college. So I, I'm back to, I'm all in, I can do anything. I can go live in a hut for six months and shoot this movie, you know, whatever. Yeah. No, that's very moving. And I think that's important for everybody who's getting into this business to hear that you have to make that conscious choice. And that- the other, the other choice is, and this is completely true, if you have a family and you have children, mm -hmm. you got to take care of your shit. If you're not making enough money as an actor, you got to make that money. Yeah. So you got to find a way to, I'm, I am an actor. I want to be an actor. I've worked as an actor, but right now I'm not. There's no ego involved in taking care of your family. You got to take care of your family. You got to pay your bills. There has to be food, electricity, insurance. That all has to be taken care of. And whatever you have to do to do that, that's number one. Mm -hmm. If you get to do that through acting, great. But the rest of the time, you got to figure out how to cover your shit. You have to. Yeah. Thank you. This is exactly a real practical life advice. Of course. Definitely. Of course. Thank you. I'm also immensely impressed by how much you do for the community while being so busy and being a parent and being a full-time actor and director. And you still find time, not just financially to donate, but you're actually there. You speak on behalf of amazing organizations. So how do you, and I would love for you to actually share about the organizations that you support and the, the incredible things they do. And how do you find all that time and juggle so many things in such an amazing way? It's, it's a struggle mm -hmm. always. However, you know, every day has 24 hours. Am I gonna be okay if I don't watch four hours of television today? I absolutely will be okay if I don't watch four hours of television today. So, you know, like two of, two of the adoption organizations I work with, there's Second Nurture mm -hmm. is great, uh, sets up communities to help people around foster and adopted kids. So, they're, so the family doesn't feel like they're on their own. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I need a doctor. Oh, well, our community has a doctor. I need a babysitter. Oh, our community has a babysitter. You know, so it's a great organization. And then the other one that I'm on the board is called You Gotta Believe in New York, which, uh, which focuses on getting, making sure older kids get in a family before they age out of the system. Um, both of those. So I'm on the board of directors of both of them. What do I have? Two, two board meetings a month, maybe. It's not, I mean, it's not like, it's not crazy, but like, because I'm on the West coast, like for example, Thursday, I have a second nurture board meeting. They're all on the East coast. So my meeting is at six 30 in the morning here. It was like, really guys, we, <laughs> you can't delay it a little. Um, but it's a commitment. I decided that this is important to me. So big deal. I have to get up to go to a board meeting on Zoom. Big deal. I mean, it's a commitment. Uh, on Sundays, uh, my son, well, he left last week, so he's back at school. But um, we, an organization here, it's called Hang Out, Do Good. Mm -hmm. And we, with uh, a number of organizations in Los Angeles, we do lunch. We, mm -hmm. we make sack sack bag, you know, bag lunches for homeless people. 
Wow. I do that every Sunday morning. Would I like to sit getting drunk at brunch instead? Sure. But it's really satisfying to me and it's important to me that we're feeding. Last week we fed 7,000 people wow. on Sunday. And that's the only meal those people are gonna get that day. And my lunches that I make, I only make 10. Everyone makes 10 lunches. My lunches that I make, I could live off that bag for two, three days. So I'm sure a homeless person could because they know what they're doing. Um, that's important to me. It doesn't take me a lot of time. Uh, I think people think when they're volunteering or helping their community, I think they think of the time commitment as something that's crazy. But the reality is if you have an hour to give, that's the hour that you have to give. If you have 10 hours to give, great. That's the 10 hours you have to give. And no, 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 the, the person giving 10 hours isn't a better volunteer than the person who's giving one hour. It's just the, the parameters of their life. That's how much time they have to give. Mm -hmm. So I, I do a lot, but it's really not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have nothing to do after this, I have nothing to do for the rest of the day except work on my book. So that's all I have to do for the rest of the day. Could, could, could I go to a homeless shelter today? Sure. I'm not going to. I do enough. <laughs> so, I mean, you figure out what you want to do. Yeah. Obviously, I looked around Los Angeles. I was working with a group that does all the legal work uh, for adoptions. Mm -hmm just fundraising for them, just using my name to help them fundraise. And as I started to think about adopting my own child, I went over there and got a little more involved. And I said, you know, what if I wanted to do this? Mm -hmm. And that's when I got really involved when I saw the number, the number of children wow. that are available is crazy. And uh, we can do better. We can, it's easy to do better and people don't know. So that if I have a voice that people are willing to listen to, I'm gonna use that voice. Mm -hmm. People, people, the facts that people have about foster and adoption are all fake and it's all a reason to say no. I'm never in, in my career as an actor, uh, in my life as a human being, I'm always looking for a way to say yes. Mm -hmm. And many people, as we've learned through the last election process, as we've learned through the pandemic even, many people are looking to say no. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wear a mask because it, it makes me safer. Yeah. No, I don't wanna wear a mask. Why are you looking for a reason to say no about that? Yeah. I have, I have a candidate who supports universal health care and one who says, no, you're on your own. Good luck. So they're looking for no. Why no? Why not? Yes. So when I started seeing the kids and the, the myths about adoption, it drove me crazy that these kids are damaged. They're not damaged. They're kids. They've been put in a bad situation. Get them out of it period. Um, or the worst one, the worst one. It's expensive. It's not expensive. The state, the county, the city, even federal pays you. They help you raise that child. Yeah. My friends have babies. They didn't get a check $1,500 a month from Los Angeles County to cover the expenses of that kid. Yeah. Nathan did, my son did. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't cost anything and there's nothing wrong with the kids. Mm -hmm. So th those are the two major things that everyone thinks like, and it's, and, oh, it's, not, and it's not my blood. That's a, that's a terrible thing, it's not your blood. My blood is horrible. I'm bald, I'm allergic to everything. Uh, I'm not tall. Uh, you know, 
I, I, I'm not a soccer star. I mean, my blood is useless. You're funny. It means nothing. <laughs> No, that's that, that that's great that you shared it, and uh, I hope that it opens hearts of many to you know. If we all give a little philosophy, you can yeah, just and, and, and and I always encourage people. Not everyone is meant to be a parent, or meant to be a foster parent, or a birth parent, mm -hmm. or an adoptive parent. Mm -hmm. But support the community that supports it. Yeah. Support the organizations around you, or donate donate an hour a week as a mentor. Go read with a kid. Mm -hmm. or go play go play with blocks with a kid yeah. uh for for a, an hour a month you know yeah i'm i'm really happy to hear that we have such opinion leaders who are so passionate about such amazing causes yeah. and thank you for for sharing it and i hope it does make a difference in many lives now What would be the three key pieces of advice that you would like to share with those just getting on that path? On Maybe which mistakes. path? Maybe mistakes. Uh, uh, well, we will concentrate on the acting path. So what would be some, maybe some mistakes to avoid? Maybe some lessons that you've learned and can now share so that they maybe go differently about certain things they planned. Yep. Um, Fine. If you want to be an actor, mm -hmm. find a way to always act. Mm -hmm. Every every community has a community theater, a uh, a church theater, a temple theater. Every community has some outlet that needs help, mm -hmm. and it doesn't even mean that you have to be the star of the show. You could be painting the sets. You could be doing advertising for the theater. You could be taking tickets at the box office. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. Be in the community, be in the community. Don't be afraid to be in the community. Um, that community is the most welcoming community that exists. Uh, so be a part of it. That's the number one. Uh, never, never think that you're done training or understanding what, whatever it is you're working on. Mm -hmm. You're never done. Yeah. So never be lazy about it because if it's something you want to do, then it's worth doing fully. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And the most important thing always in life and certainly in theater in acting, listen, just fucking listen, see what's in front of you and know what it is. If someone's a liar or a phony or someone's honest and true, or someone is passionate, or someone is not passionate. See it, look at it, talk about it, and listen. Listen, listen, listen. Listening is the most important thing that exists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to end this amazing, honest, authentic, just so, so open <laughs> masterclass, uh, who would you like to nominate to also send the elevator back down and help other aspiring actors and filmmakers make it hopefully one day? What you mean suggest other people for masterclass? Yeah. Oh, I I can't. I mean anyone. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Try Tim Decay from White Collar. He's <laughs> he's a good uh, talker as well. Um, just look look for people that inspire you. Mm -hmm. You know, just because someone is famous, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that doesn't mean that they're inspirational. Mm -hmm. They could be very quietly just doing their thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I've actors, I've, you know, no, no one needs to hear a, a, an acting masterclass from uh, Bruce Willis. <laughs> he obviously doesn't want to talk about it or else we would see him out there being passionate about it all the time. Whereas Jeff Goldblum teaches acting classes mm -hmm. because he's passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And about, because basically the, those of us who are passionate about it are not trying to turn the world into a bunch of terrible actors. <laughs> we believe what we're telling people is going to help them in their life. Mm -hmm. It's not just about doing a part or getting a part or getting paid for a job. It's about a different way, a different viewpoint of looking at your life, being present, listening, being alive, 
every every person should have a favorite artist, a favorite book, a favorite uh, rock and roll band, a favorite TV show. What is your favorite? And that comes from this kind of training. Whether you ever act or not, half the people who take my acting workshop, I haven't done it in a couple of years, mm -hmm. but half the people who take my acting workshop are not actors. And they have no plans to be. But it's about plugging yourself into the planet. Mm -hmm. You can work yourself, you can work that into acting, which is great, but you can also work it into your every day of your life. Wow. And that's important. Thank you. That was that was a lot of wisdom for one master. It's a lot. Of stuff. It's a, lot. It's <laughs> it was a, a lot. lot of stuff. But thank you so much, Willie. Uh, you you are so giving and so kind, and you just have such an amazing approach to many aspects of life. And it really was a pleasure to to well, have. Thank that. you for having me, and uh, I hope you do well. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone who's been watching, and we hope to see you on big screens very soon and on major streaming platforms. Even small ones. And the small ones. <laughs>